I don't think there was a punchline. <laughs> so first off, this is one of the funniest stand-up history documentaries I've ever oh, seen. Oh, wow. Wow, and, thanks, man. And primarily, it looks at the past. It's about you and Dana in your younger years, moving past trauma, then creating comedy out of it. When did you both realize you had the type of reflection to make this film, and how did you approach assembling it? Uh, well, first of all, thanks. That's really nice. You know, I, unlike other movies that I've made, I, I usually get to see them with people, like even in the editing process, you know, yeah. like when I did uh, uh, when I did World's Greatest Dad, a movie I did with my friend Rob Williams, uh, there's a lot of that movie that I watched with the cleaning staff in the editing facility. It's true. <laughs> I'd say, hey, you want to watch something? They go, they're like, what are we watching? You know, <laughs> The son's dead. This movie. is creepy. So, um, you know, Dana and I started doing this two man show and and we we would go out and flip a coin to see who was going to be the headliner. And and then we realized that time when we we're out on stage just screwing around, flipping the coin got longer and longer. And the audience <laughs> seemed to like that more than our actual individual sets. So we started doing these shows. So then I thought, well, let's shoot it. And the idea was to shoot it over a bunch of towns and, and stuff. And um, because then I thought, because when you do a special, you're always going, oh, damn it. I didn't get the good version of that, you know? And even when I work with comedians as a I direct stand-up specials. So I thought, well, I'll shoot a whole bunch of them and shoot us at, at, at behind the scenes and cobble a special together. But then the pandemic hit right, right when we wrapped on this. So... So now I, I had a lot more time and I got to work with the editors and, and, and dig around and, and go, is there enough here for a narrative? And, you know, and sure enough, uh, there is a narrative. Uh, the, the narrative is I'm an asshole, but uh, <laughs> it, it was, you know, it's funny, my ego, as a filmmaker, my ego is like going, well, I think there's a story here, but unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not wearing a white hat. And uh, and uh, so so the storyteller won out over the the ego. That's awesome. <laughs> OK, so you made your reputation on that funny voice and Andy Kafkaesque esque persona. What was the first time you appeared in stand up using your real voice, a different or more traditional form of joke telling? And was there something that triggered your decision to do that? Well, there's two 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 stories for that. Okay. One, I'll do. I'll try to do this fast. All right. I was in Atlanta in the '80s, and I'm opening. It was four thousand people, like the, an arena. I'm in an outdoor arena, and I'm up there, and the whole show. I'm just getting pounded with a free bird, free bird. You know, they just keep yelling free bird because, and then I just, I just snap. I go. Leonard Skinner's dead. Uh, the slaves have been emancipated. The South's not rising again. There's no chicken in the bread basket picking out dough. And Leonard Skinner's <laughs> dead, you stupid XXX blank hillbillies. And then I look at the bottom of the stage and these biker looking dudes are climbing up on stage and they've got laminated passes around their neck. It says Leonard Skinner survivors to her 87. Oh it was the surviving members of Leonard Skinner. That's why the crowd was yelling Freebird. So oh, some sometimes it's not about me. That's what I learned. And that was the first time, if you really want to know, as an adult, when I used my real voice, because I'm like, Leonard Skinner's dead, ah! you know? And then uh, I, the, <laughs> the guy's on stage next to me and he's big and he goes, hey man, we're not dead. And I go, Tony, get the car. Like, like I got healed from whatever. <laughs> clear as a bell tony get the car like like <laughs> it's like i was like an announcer but that's the first time i dropped the persona on stage but wow. uh you know i actually remember this i i after i directed the kimmel show i went back on the road and i thought i didn't like stand-up uh and i thought there was a million reasons i thought i didn't like the audience i didn't like uh the opening acts or the traveling i thought all this stuff and then it hit me Oh, I don't like this persona. Now, I there was there's a large audience, or there was an audience that that came out to see me do this character. So I had a jettison it if I was going to keep doing stand up. So I I I I was in Nashville and I was at the Zanies and uh, 
I, I said, I'm, I'm going to be me. And I went up and, uh, and I spoke in my real voice and people were crabby about it. They, <laughs> there was people going do the voice, you know, they, you know, uh, but I had to do it for my own sanity. And there was another time in my career where I was really good at celebrity bashing. And sometimes I still slip, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but I had a, I had a jettison that for my act too, because I just couldn't take, it wasn't that I was afraid of the repercussions in show business about attacking people in show business. It was just, I didn't like how it made me feel, you know? So I had a, I, I made two big decisions. One at one point was to stop bashing celebrities. And then Two was to uh, 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 jettison the persona, which is all really funny because, like, you know, years go by, <laughs> and lo and behold, I, you know, uh, yeah, I was pretty vicious to Jerry Seinfeld, but I, I truly thought uh, that 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 was a long time ago, and then you know, and then he he I went nuts. Out he doesn't. Re he always remembers. Yeah, he so. <laughs> but the funny thing is, is like it's a very aggressive, weird thing on that uh, comedians and cars that he does. Yes, comedians and cars dissecting comedy till nothing's funny anymore, or whatever the name of the show is. And um, <laughs> I, there's nothing more disgusting than comics talking about comedy. I, it just makes me want to shoot my face off. Like oh, actually, Jeff. there's something worse. There's people who aren't in comedy talking about it as if it's sports. <laughs> Top 10 all-time goats of, you know, it's, uh, shut up. What, jocks ruin everything. So, uh, the brofication of, of stand-up. Uh, I don't know where that happened. So, um, but it made me laugh. It's like, it's like Seinfeld's like really crazy. And he's like, yeah, you tell him I said that. And, <laughs> and he looks nuts and he's and um, yeah, I just felt like it was like a Western and, you know, cause I'm like this, I'm like this gunslinger that hung up his 45s, you know, and then they, yeah. they go Seinfeld's down in the town square and he's calling you out. And I'm like, oh man, I'm out of that game. And they go, well, he's really mad. And I go, okay. And I take the 45s down and <laughs> I'm like, it's, uh, you it's know, so apropos. it's like, I don't think you want to get into this. I don't think you want to get in this fight, Jerry. Yeah, Just yeah. sit on your piles of money, and exactly. you know. And, That's what he'll he, mention if he. If he did. Yeah, he, he would have been fine because, like, it was really crazy when that happened. Because I was looking, and he was like saying that this was his. That was his the highlight of the season for him. It's so yeah. bananas, but you know, he's a sore winner, and it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I I uh, uh, I generally don't wake up like going. Oh, Seinfeld, really? You know, I, you know, but uh, I did get a little dirty. I went, I in the movie, I get it down in the, <laughs> I get down there a little bit. This is Patrick McDonald for HollywoodChicago.com, copyright 2021.